As a board game designer, I have written a lot of rules for the games I create. I've also reviewed many other designers' rules. I've been a judge for the Cardboard Edison Award for a couple of times and will be a judge again this year. The Cardboard Edison Award is a contest to find the best unpublished board game. Designers submit their games, including their rules, and then judges, like me, score the games with the highest scored ones moving on to the final stage, where judges actually play the games in person before deciding on a winner. The winner then usually gains a lot of interest from publishers who might want to publish the game. Or they might gain more followers and credibility before launching a Kickstarter if they want to self-publish. Some of the judges are also publishers, and I've heard that some of them will even approach designers if they are interested in publishing a game that they judge for the Cardboard Edison Award. Now unfortunately, the deadline to submit your game for this year's Cardboard Edison Award has passed, but keep it in mind for next year if it's something that interests you. The deadline is usually in January. I include reminders about the Cardboard Edison Award in my weekly newsletter and also include the deadline on the Google Calendar I made for my members, which you can gain access to if you click on the Join button below. People have also hired me to review their rules. And if you would like me to review your rules as well, feel free to get in touch. I'll include my email in the description below. I also play at least one new game every week, so I'm constantly reading rule books of published games as well. So all of this is to say I have read a lot of board game rules, and I have noticed some issues tend to come up all the time. And so I would guess that you might be struggling with these too. I still struggle with making my rules clear and concise. Us board game designers need to have so many different skills. We need to have strong creative muscles to generate new ideas. We need to be project managers to coordinate and run all of our play tests. We need to be graphic designers if we want to make digital versions of our games on Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator. And we also need to be good writers so that our rules are easy to understand for both players and publishers. So I hope this video will help you with your rule writing. Before we begin, I did want to mention that you don't need to worry too much about editing your rules until your game is further along the playtesting process and you're starting to pitch to publishers or thinking about running a crowdfunding campaign to self-publish. When you first think of a game, you can jot down the general rules of how you think the game will play and then update that document as you go along, shaping it based off your playtests. So this video is really for people who have thoroughly playtested their games, meaning the games are pretty much in their final state and ready to be pitched or self-published. Now let's get right into it with the first thing that is likely wrong with your rules. They're too long. They are too long. They're too long. I can pretty much guarantee that your rules are too long. This is the number one issue for rules that I review and for my own rules as well. We tend to repeat ourselves or over explain things or say things in 100 words that could have been said in 50. So either have a friend review your rules and ask them to cross out anything that is redundant or unnecessary or try to review your own rules with fresh eyes, trying to be as objective as possible, which is really difficult to do. So it's definitely better to have someone else take a look and be ruthless. Cut, cut, cut. Just like when you design a new game and include so much stuff, through playtesting, you eventually start cutting and streamlining things until everything works like a well-oiled machine. Do the same thing with your rules. Make them as concise as possible so that players and publishers can understand how to play the game as quickly as possible. So many great games do not get played or haven't been picked up by a publisher simply because readers couldn't understand how to play the game. I have had a self-published game in my collection for many years and really, really want to play it. The components look beautiful and it's seems like a really fun game. It's a lightweight strategy game for ages 10 and up, and the rules are 20 pages. 20 pages. I can't tell you how many times I have tried to sit down and slog through that rule book, and I have failed every time. So please, make your rules as easy to read and understand as possible so that they aren't an obstacle that players have to fight through in order to be able to play your game. And so what are some of the reasons rules can be too long? Well, one of them is too many edge case rules. What I mean by this is having additional sections in your rule book explaining what happens if a certain specific and rare thing happens with a different outcome than what normally happens in the game. It's fine if you have one, maybe two of these explainer boxes 
boxes for specific scenarios. But if your rulebook requires more than that, then that is a sign that the game needs to be playtested more. There should not be so many situations coming up like this in your game, and there are likely issues in the gameplay that need to be resolved. Another thing that can make rules way too long is too many variants. It's fine if your cooperative game can also be played in teams or having a solo variant, but if you have pages and pages of different ways to play your game, your reader's eyes will likely glaze over and they'll be so overwhelmed that they won't know where to start and they might not start at all. You as the designer should know the optimal way to play your game for the best overall experience. And the player wants you to tell them the best way to play the game. That's why I'm not a huge fan of having a ton of different variations for a game. I like testing a game thoroughly to find the best version of it and move forward with that. Of course, this is up to you, but if the variants you include in your rulebook are not as fun as the base game, I would cut them. This will not only reduce the length of the rules, but will also increase the chance that the players will enjoy the game. And if your players are feeling confused or frustrated just from reading your rules, they are likely to just put the game back on the shelf and move on to something else. And this next thing frustrates me more than anything else on this list. Referring to something before explaining what it is. If you say, Players can move their short-range aerial bots up to five spaces in their bordering regions but not beyond the galactic impasse line without explaining what short-range aerial bots bordering regions or galactic impasse lines are, you are guaranteed to make your readers feel annoyed pretty quick. I mean, I feel annoyed just reading that and I just made it up. Don't explain how to interact with something before explaining what that thing is. This will lead to confusion. And another thing that will create confusion and make it so difficult for players to understand how to play a game is when there's no overview at the start explaining how to win. Once I say that, it seems so obvious, right? But you would be surprised how many designers don't include an overview at the start of the rules with a brief explanation of how to play the game and most importantly how to win. I also see this in pitches. Designers will pitch their games without starting with how to win. Remember, always start your rules and your pitches with a brief overview of the game, including how to win. Some designers will only have the win condition at the end of the rules, but you need to start and end your rules with that information. I've included a link to my rules template in the description below, which you're free to use. It includes the different sections I use for my rules and are organized in a way that makes sense to me, including having the overview at the start. Now, in your rules, I'm sure there will be important information that you want to stand out to the reader, but make sure you don't use to too many text formatting options. If every second word is either bolded, italicized, in all caps, underlined, or in a different color, they won't stand out at all. Formatting options meant to highlight important words completely lose their function when they are used too much and inconsistently. I'm a big fan of bolding certain important words in my rules so they stand out, but I will try to not use any other formatting tools. I only bold and I will bold selectively. So choose one, I definitely suggest bolding, and stick with it throughout your rules. When some words are bolded, but some are underlined and others are all caps, the reader might wonder if the type of formatting used is trying to tell them something. But usually Usually it's just the designer wanting to highlight something and just using whatever tool they feel like for that word. Don't do this. It's confusing. Be consistent and selective with your highlighting tools. And notice how I did not include quotation marks. Quotation marks are not meant to be used for highlighting words. They are meant for quoting things. Please, please, please. Do not use quotation marks as a way to emphasize words. That is not what they are meant for. And speaking of inconsistencies, there is another one that comes up a lot. Inconsistent use of pronouns. I've seen rule books where sometimes the player is referred to as he, sometimes she, sometimes the player, and sometimes you. Just like with formatting options, pick one and stick with it. I personally prefer the player so that anyone reading the rule book can feel included and like the rule book was written for them to read. So for example, the player then draws three cards. But Whatever you choose, just remember to stay consistent with it throughout the rules. Now, moving on to the visuals of the rules. And if you don't have any visuals, well, this next point is for you. Not enough helpful images. Use Google Draw or some other easy to use program to create visuals of your components and your setup and any other specific images that might be helpful for your players. You can also create a digital version of your game in Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator and take screenshots of the components and setup and different play scenarios that you can include in your rules. Or if you have a physical prototype, you can lay out the game and take photos that you can include in your rules. 
Having images is especially helpful for components because you might know which piece is the first player marker, but the players would have no way of knowing that without an image of the marker. And it can be a lot easier to show someone how something works with a picture than trying to explain it with words. So complement your text with images showing what you are explaining. And be sure that those images aren't too far away and disconnected from the text. The reader shouldn't have to look too far away to see the image that the text is referring to. They should be able to read and look at the image at the same time. But when you add images to your text, you can run into the following problem, not enough white space. And by white space, I don't mean literally white, I just mean empty space that doesn't have text or images in it. When readers are met with a wall of text and images with no white space, they can be overwhelmed and not be able to retain any of the information. Readers need to have a bit of breathing room on the page. So please don't try to cram every single space with text and images. Having some empty space will make the information more digestible. Here is an example from Pandemic of how to clearly show a game setup using visuals, minimal text, and lots of white space. And notice how step number one is in the top left corner, not step number eight because readers almost always start in the top left corner. So have the first step there. And speaking of numbers, the last item on this list is a fairly minor thing, but it's something I see all the time, not writing out numbers. I have found that publishers like to spell out numbers. So three instead of three. This can make the text easier to understand and follows the Chicago manual of style that they are likely referencing. I now write out all of my numbers in my rules to more closely match the style of most publishers. This is a small thing, but it removes one more thing that might be jarring for the reader. So there you go, the top issues I see with rule books. I hope this video was helpful for you. If it was, I hope you consider liking and subscribing. As always, I want to thank my awesome members. Thank you so much for your support. I truly appreciate it. You can click on the join button below if you want to join my membership program, which will give you access to weekly playtesting sessions, our members only Discord channel, and many other perks. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to follow me on social media at Pamwalls Game Design, and I'll see you in the next video.